Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. We come to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that continues to thrive here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society. Tonight, I'm pleased to host Jess McHugh to talk with us about best-selling books in American history. I'm also joined by AAS Director of Outreach, Kayla Hopper. Before introducing tonight's guest, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. And for newcomers, I want to introduce the society briefly. The American Antiquarian Society was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. We're a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're devoted to understanding and sharing the history and culture of North America before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts and ephemera. In addition to this virtual program, we have a variety of other public programs. We offer visiting research fellowships, and we welcome scholars and readers from around the world to use our reading room to work on their own research projects. I'm delighted to say that we are once again welcoming readers into the reading room by appointment. Particularly relevant to tonight's program, the American Antiquarian Society is an intellectual hub for the history of books and reading in America. Our program in the history of the book in American culture, now four decades old, has sponsored symposia, summer seminars, and currently a monthly virtual book talk series the last Thursday afternoon of each month, including this Thursday afternoon at two o'clock. The American Antiquarian Society led the creation of the five volume series, A History of the Book in America, and researchers find in our collections extraordinary materials for studying the publishing, distribution, and consumption of all sorts of printed materials, including our author tonight, who used AAS's collections to write her book. We're happy to present programs like this one free of charge, though of course running them isn't without expense. If you wish to help support programs like this one, a link to AAS's giving page will be available in the chat. Before I introduce tonight's guest, Kayla will offer a quick overview on the platform we're using for this program. Kayla? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Just a few notes about how we'll be using the webinar functions tonight. For the Q&A portion of the program at the end, we'll be using the dedicated Q&A function, not the chat box. By using the Q&A function, we'll be better able to keep track of questions and it also has an upvote function. So if someone posts a question that you wanna see discussed, be sure to upvote it to help get it to the top of the queue. You can place your questions into the Q&A function at any point during the program and I'll send some reminders about doing that. Due to the large number of attendees tonight, the chat box will be used only for informational purposes. Throughout the program, I'll post relevant links and information there and you can contact, contact us if there's any technical difficulty that we should know about. If you would like to save the chat to retain the links for future use, you can save a transcription of it by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. Closed captioning is also available for tonight's program via Zoom's live transcription function. You can turn the closed captioning on and off with the button labeled CC. Finally, we are recording this program and we'll make it available on our website and YouTube channel for viewing later. And that's it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kayla. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Jess McHugh is a writer, editor, and researcher who's reported from North and South America, Europe, the Caribbean, and West Africa, culturing, covering culture, politics, history, and identity. She's written thousands of stories, ranging from the fight to preserve world heritage in Palmyra, Syria, to the story of the first American dictionary. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, The Nation, Paris Review Daily, Time.com, and The Guardian, among many other venues. She studied 19th century poetry at Yale. Since then, she has interviewed UN diplomats, US senators, former members of the Irish Republican Army, and the errant amateur witch. She covered the, the 2015 Paris attacks on the ground, meeting musicians, refugees, and other Parisians working toward the city's recovery. Jess's book, Americanon, An Unexpected U.S. History in 13 Best-Selling Books, 
was published by Dutton in June, and that's the subject of our conversation this evening. Jess, welcome. It's great to have you here tonight. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. You're a journalist who's reported stories from four continents. What led you to write a book about best-selling American books that date all the way back to the Old Farmer's Almanac and go up to the seven habits of highly effective people? Great question. Also, excuse my uh, raspy voice, I've got a bit of a laryngitis spell I'm getting over. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good question. It all, you know, really started with the dictionary. As you kind of mentioned briefly in my bio, I've, I've written quite a bit about, about cultural heritage. And to me, Webster's Dictionary is in and of itself a piece of kind of American cultural heritage, broadly speaking. So, you know, I became interested in Merriam-Webster. I had grown up, you know, with the Collegiate Dictionary, but I was interested in what their work during the election and the run-up to the election. So, you know, they were fact-checking all these political figures and kind of throwing jabs at, at especially Trump's use of language, but really everybody's use of language. And I had remembered this sort of throwaway comment in a lecture that Noah Webster had been a, a born-again Christian and a nationalist. And I remember thinking, hmm, I wonder what he would make of this. And so it, it, it's, it wasn't exactly quite as simple as that, but the more I looked at the dictionary, the more I realized that it was there to, to educate people about so much more than words. It was really, you know, a linguistic declaration of independence in many ways. And, and in his mind, a, a kind of manner of, of rallying Americans, new Americans, young Americans around this kind of newfound identity. So that's what led me to this broader interest in similar books that I think, you know, on the surface level, we're teaching some people one thing, but on another level, we're really educating them about their place in America and their kind of duties, responsibilities, maybe the values that they should have, and so on and so forth. That's really fascinating. And the books you've chosen range across two centuries. All of them seem to have some element of guidebook or how-to or self-help, but they range. They, they date all the way back to the Old Farmer's Almanac, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, um, and then they go up to the Betty Crocker pitch, picture book and, and everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask, which, which leads me to wonder, how did you choose this set of books given the huge range of best-selling possibilities? Sure. So it was a hard question. And, you know, it took me years of, of research and taking things on and off the list. I knew that I wanted to focus on didactic books, books that were teaching you something in some way, whether it was explicitly self-help or whether it were a cookbook or an almanac. And the reason for that, you know, I love great books. I love literature. It's what I, it's my background. But I, I had this appreciation that for many people, even up into the 20th century, when novels were more kind of readily available, were not reading novels or were not reading them every day. And and I, you know, I think there are a great many books about the great many books that we have, but I, I had always wanted to write a book about middle class life, about, you know, the people like the ones in my family and the, and the books that they grew up with, the books that maybe their ancestors had grown up with. If you only own five books in 1850 or 1950, what were they and what were they teaching you? So that's kind of one aspect. And then the second part in terms of selecting the books themselves, I wanted to focus on as much of the data as I possibly could to kind of avoid regional bias, personal bias. So a lot of that was, you know, looking at bestseller lists, Publishers Weekly, uh, the New York Times. I also, you know, looked at some of the older publications like Bookman. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit more complicated as we can discuss in the 19th and 18th century when people were not keeping the kind of list that we do now. Um, so a lot of that involved um, archival work, interviewing a lot of historians, doing kind of some primary source work about editions and publishers happening in, in some of these earlier books. Yeah, and that that does raise interesting questions about how we how we determine what was a bestseller. I mean, today the New York Times we have the New York Times bestseller list and others, which probably you probably know more about this than I do. They probably have their own selection issues. I mean, you know how how does the New York Times bestseller list work? And and then if you go back two hundred years when there was no bestseller list, I mean, what what do we use to figure it out? What what kinds of measures were used? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's a question that's quite fluid even now. The New York Times bestseller list has essentially a kind of a certain number of specific booksellers that report to them that are not necessarily the biggest booksellers. And they take that data, whereas Publishers Weekly takes a more broad set of data. So even now, there's disagreement over what constitutes a bestseller. And it also varies depending on which time of year a book is published. In February, a book that sells, you know, 
800 or 1,000 copies in the first week might become a bestseller, according to the New York Times, whereas a book that has to sell 5,000 books in September in a week to become a bestseller. So it's still in flux. But in the 19th and 18th century, a lot of, you know, there's some disagreement about this among scholars. A lot of it has to do with the publisher self-reporting. It also has to do with the number of editions that a book goes through. And that can be a kind of uh, a teller of how well it's selling. So, you know, Catherine Beecher's A Treatise on Domestic Economy goes through 15 editions in 15 years. Which is a good, which is a good sign for that. There's also, you know, a lot of. I was lucky enough to rely on the work of a lot of other historians, especially for some of the big names like McGuffey and Webster. At a certain point, when you've interviewed or read or read the work of, you know, twelve or thirteen or twenty historians who are all saying this book sold around hundred million copies. That's what I'll stick to, and so I'm in debt to many people for that that work as well. And that's what's interesting also about your your choices is. You know, if we think about today's bestseller lists, they might record things that are bestsellers currently, and things might stay on the bestseller list for a year. But a lot of the books you've chosen were steady sellers, not just bestsellers. Mm -hmm. They last over decades and longer. And that seems to be, in a sense, distinct from even the notion of bestseller of the moment. Certainly. It's quite rare. I mean, for a book these days to be on the bestseller list for one week is considered extraordinary. Whereas many of these books were essentially bestsellers for decades. I think, you know, uh, the autobiography of, of Benjamin Franklin is a good example of a book that sold many, many copies over the course of several decades when it came out. And I, I want to say 1794, but now it still, you know, appears on something like 400 uh, high school and college syllabi per year. So it has a slow burn. The Old Farmer's Almanac, which is one of the very first books that I consulted um, in the American Antiquarian Society in 2018, similarly, you know, comes out in 1792, and it's still selling th about 3 million copies per year, which is just staggering. That's extraordinary, actually, to think about it selling 3 million copies per year when, when most books that come out today don't probably sell more than 3,000. Yes, <laughs> yes. That old, yeah. And in fact, when you mentioned the Old Farmer's Almanac, puts me in mind of, of something you do in a number of the chapters, um, you know, and this may, may connect with your own work as a journalist, you don't just talk about the book in its own time, you also talk about its publication today. And I love how you, you went up to what, Northern New England to talk with the current day proprietors of the Old Farmer's Almanac, and you talk with uh, relatives of, of Emily Post to talk about the, the etiquette books today. Yes, this is one of the, the most fun for me parts of this work because I love you know, doing primary source work and, and archival work, but I it can get quite lonely, as I think many people know. And so it was a real um, it was a real treat. I did this long road trip up to um, up to Dublin, New Hampshire, which is about, I think, a thousand people <laughs> town where the Old Farmer's Almanac is located. Went up to Burlington to the Emily Post Institute. And I think to me, what helps what, what helps so much about doing those interviews is, A, it, it brings a bit of levity to to to, to, you know, stories about America that can be otherwise sometimes heavy. And, you know, the Old, old Farmer's Almanac is just delightful. And the people who work there are quirky and they can tell you about butternut squash soup, soup recipes and counting spiders and acorns and all of the kind of wonderful folklore that we love about the Almanac. And similarly with Emily Post, I was kind of surprised by how laid back they were now. So I think it, it, it provides an, a kind of interesting counterbalance to perhaps the way that the books were initially used as to the way that they are used now, which I think has more to do with nostalgia and for a longing for a, a lost America, at least in some people's mind, or a longing for a return to a kind of imagined simpler time. That's interesting. I mean, sticking with those two books, because you've looked at them over a long haul, my sense is that the etiquette book has been updated over time to reflect maybe more recent notions about etiquette. Is that true of the Farmer's Almanac or is that, I mean, when you think about these books over time, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. Mm. Some of the others seem to go through change over time. Yeah, that's a great point because Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is one of those books that people's readings of it have changed so, so, you know, vastly. It had this, this moment where people like Mark Twain in the late 19th century hated it. And then it sees this renaissance, you know, later on in the 20th century. What is, what is unique about many of these books, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, Farmer's Almanac, and Emily Post Etiquette, to name a few, are that they are constantly updated. Every year, the Farmer's Almanac is fully new. None of the content is recycled. Similarly with Emily Post Etiquette, some of it remains, but I think it's been revised, you know, I 
want to say close to at least upwards of 20 times. So the idea with that too is that part of the longevity of these books is that people find something of value in them regardless of the time. But I think part of it too is that someone or, or several someones had decided that these things should last. And so they ensure that they do by, by keeping them fresh while maintaining some aspect of, of, of that kind of core that attracted people in the first place. And that is what keeps people hanging on year after year and, and using them, reusing them and so on. You know, one of the things that you, you mentioned at the beginning is how these books give ideas about what is America or what are American values. I think it's it's important to note that throughout Americanon, you also describe who's left out of these bestsellers images of the United States. In, in some sense, nearly every one of these books was fundamentally conservative, shoring up older values or concepts of culture in the midst of, of social and economic change. Sure, yeah. So I think what unites so many of these books is that they do appear in moments of great upheaval, whether it's post-revolution or whether it's after an economic downturn clustered around world war. Um, I kind of, I, I would say they encourage conformity rather than conservatism, just because so many of them were written when the U.S. as a nation was still in diapers, so to speak, so there wasn't much to conserve. Um, however, yeah, I think I think you make a great point, which is that uh, diversity, I think, is one of the great strengths of, of, of the United States, and yet it's it's been treated as kind of one of the great weaknesses by so many of these authors. And so much of our, our identity historically has been constructed from a place of opposition. So it starts off, you know, in, in, in the late 18th century as, you know, we're not British, and then it becomes, you know, we're not Catholics, we're not a certain number of immigrant groups. And, and things slowly change and expand. But what I hope this book encourages people to think about is, is the ways in which some of that inequality is not just us not living up to our potential. It's been baked in the pie, so to speak, in the ways that we've encouraged kind of standards or um, what really, you know, Noah Webster would say is the standard, but for us really is, is a way of kind of flattening out difference. Yeah, and, and you write, and I think this is really great in your chapter about the McGuffey readers, where you know you you make the point that you know McGuffey is extreme holding on to certain traditional values and and not admitting others. And, and you write about, you know, you take that and go to school curricula all the way to today. And you you write, you know, the fight to include diverse authors within school curricula, too, is one aspect of an ongoing negotiation over who is included, not just in class syllabi, but in the identity of American. It's a remedy to what writer Chimimanda Ngozi Adichie has called the danger of a single story. When we have only one definition of what ident American identity means, we we all suffer, not just minority groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. exactly. I, I think that's the idea is that it, it, uh, so many of these authors, McGuffey being one of them, feared that, that something would be lost by including more people. And yet, you know, it, we've just seen time and time again by looking at some of the great American authors that that's simply not the case. And and the irony for, for McGuffey is he was this, you know, sort of frontier boy raised in what was then the Western frontier, what is now Ohio, Pennsylvania. And he was the son of a Scottish immigrant, so a relatively new arrival to the United States. And yet his book, um, was very explicitly anti-Catholic. It was often explicitly anti-immigrant. And then the book was translated into certain uh, indigenous languages and used sort of as a tool of quote unquote Americanization for these peoples that had been there way longer than McGuffey and his family, which I think is was an irony lost on him at the time. Um, but I think that's just one example of many in which uh, these authors attempted to impose a single definition of American on, on quite a, a, a multifarious nation. And you know, you're talking about McGuffey and where McGuffey comes from puts me in mind of how you tell the story of Dale Carnegie, mm. who, who does not start out as Dale Carnegie, C-A-R-N-E-G-I-E. -E. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about him? It's, it's a great story about how he comes from a place very different from, from where we, we think him of him ending up. 
Sure, yeah. He was born Dale Carnegie, and that was spelled uh, C-A-R-N-A-G-E-Y uh, in, you know, the Missouri farmland. He was so poor. I think his, his family was deeply indebted. And, you know, he describes in his um, autobiography that he wrote this kind of long letter to his daughter that one of his first memories was the smell of burning hog flesh as his parents had to burn these pigs that died every year in their farm from cholera. And he had to ride to school on horseback in these kind of patched Dolly Parton-esque clothes because they were so poor they couldn't even afford clothes for after he had had a growth spurt. So it, it honestly gave me, as with many of these authors, even when well, I can appreciate the criticisms that I had and that many others have of Dale Carnegie and McGuffey and many others. There is, um, you, have, you have to have sympathy for the guy the more you learn about his story. And I think it made all the more sense that someone with what he describes as a deep insecurity wants to write a book, wants to create a philosophy about confidence and about smiling and about charm because he sees it not as a way to trick people, but as a way to protect himself from humiliation. And that's something that resonates on quite a huge scale when it comes out amid the Great Depression and many others are feeling kind of ashamed of, of what they're living through even if it's not their fault. And in certain ways, he picks up on Franklin because so much of Franklin is about appearance and projection as well as being about character and moral virtue. So much of Franklin, you know, when he write, writes about leaving, leaving a light on, burning late at night, it's about to showing others that you're industrious, whether or not you are. It seems as though Franklin yes. is talking back. Yeah, exactly. And and Franklin, I think, is, is such a fascinating figure because he's he's really remembered for his deeds, of which, you know, there are many, so that's rightly so. And at the same time, he was this incredible performer. I live in France, so I often think of Franklin in France as his, his greatest performance. He, you know, was this learned man. He was a scientist and a scholar, but he shows up to Paris wearing, like, a Martin fur cap that he's borrowed. He doesn't wear these kind of clothes and these Quaker clothes that he thinks is how the French imagine, you know, the frontiersmen of of the United States to be, and he charms everybody by playing this, this role. And this is something that I think Dill Carnegie appreciates, especially he picks up on the aspect of performance. And he's, he was very explicit in his life that he, he worshiped Franklin. And I got to meet actually some of the, the current uh, leadership at the Dale Carnegie, Dale Carnegie and Associates, and they had rebuilt kind of a replica of his office. And I noticed that he had, you know, a very early edition of Franklin's biography, autobiography, and they told me, Oh, actually, he had every single employee read this book before they could start working for him because it was such a seminal text. And I think it speaks to the fact that so many of these books, even when you get into the 20th century, are really building on the values and the kind of blocks of understanding American identity that often come from as early as the 18th century. And we, we've been talking about Franklin and Carnegie, and in some ways, Franklin becomes the, the model for young men who think of themselves as in the process of self-making. Mm -hmm. But there are also books for women here in this book. And, you know, starting with, with Catherine Beecher in the, in the 1830s, what kinds of stories and lessons are women being taught in the same period when men are taught by Benjamin Franklin to be out there making themselves in some way? Mm. So women are really taught to be out there making men <laughs> in one way or another. Uh, you know, Catherine Beecher encourages women to raise and teach American citizens. So her idea is that women are uniquely suited to be teachers, but they're uniquely su also suited to be teachers, you know, both in the kind of uh, professorial sense, but also in the more raising their own children sense, which is, which is a little bit ironic given that she never married, never had children. So the idea for her, I think, in retrospect, can be quite limiting because the idea is sort of of this, this kind of Republican motherhood virtue that, that women can serve their nation by raising ever more Christian, ever more virtuous American citizens who will then make the laws and lead the people. At the same time, I think it's hard to deny, and I've interviewed a few Beecher scholars who convinced me of this over time, that there is something radical about what she's saying because, you know, yes, scrubbing a toilet for the sake of America might not be what we want now. But in 1841, there, there is some real power in this idea that women can play an important role 
in nation building, even if it's not how we might imagine it now. And I think that comes to the fore, especially during the Civil War and post-Civil War, when she argues ever more radical things, such as women's people to build communities, to raise orphans, and to kind of, she's almost describing what would be understood as a commune now. Um, so so yeah, that's what I will say about her. Yeah, and, and, you know, you mentioned the scrubbing toilets. It, a woman like Catherine Beecher, and the people she's writing for, are they actually doing that? Or are they women who might have servants who do that? And what, is it, what does it mean for the servants to think about what Catherine Beecher is talking about? Is, is that even a path open to them? Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because she, she, she likely did, at least in certain points of her life, she struggled with money, so that goes in flux. But yes, I think especially people of her class overwhelmingly did have servants and they were often, you know, Catholic servants to whom this book certainly was not intended. I had, you know, one um, one of feature scholars say the idea was she would convert the Protestant mistresses who would then convert their Irish handmaids. So I think that's sort of what we're talking about. And it, and it happens quite a lot in the, I would say the overwhelming majority of these books that many of the authors were speaking to an audience of whom they were not a member. So, you know, whether it's Catherine Beecher talking to women having children or whether it's, you know, Dill Carnegie speaking to people who are a salesman. And he, even though he comes from really a farming background, uh, people are not always practicing what they preach. Uh, and in some ways, that was, I think, perhaps not a particularly American thing, but but something that that struck me as as you know what's what's good for the goose might necessarily might not always be good for the cancer. And and over the course of your research, did you find episodes of people rejecting the messages found in these best-selling books and these steady sellers pushing back against the ideas and ideologies in them? Yes, you do. And I mean, it's hard to say because the people who were maybe not buying into these books wouldn't have necessarily left a physical trace always. So that's something to keep in mind. But you do find them, especially in the 20th century when publishers' addresses say are more readily available to people. So um, <clears throat> I include Betty Crocker's Picture Cookbook because it's the best-selling cookbook in American history, sold about 75 million copies. And Betty Crocker was not a real person, but she receives thousands upon thousands, sometimes four to 5,000 letters per day, especially in the mid-century. And the, you know, the vast majority are positive. But there are, I noticed a few that say, especially during World War II, look, I'm working in a defense plant. I don't have time to make a cake every day. And frankly, I kind of think this is, you know, BS. And so there is a little bit of that, but for every one critical letter, there's probably 200 glowing letters. But I think it's it also in some ways that's, it's kind of a function of, of what a bestseller does, which is that it reflects something that is a widely held belief in some way, and then blows it up to bigger proportions. So certainly, you know, when, when Betty Crocker's book comes out in post-World War II, not everyone believes that women should be at home cooking cakes, but enough do or are raised to believe that they should think so. Right. And, and of course, at, in that aftermath of World War II, women have, have gone to work during the war. And Betty Crocker's cookbook is almost a way of saying, now it's time to return home. It's sort of the, the, very, the very sort of mentality that Betty Friedan in the early 60s will, critic, will critique in The Feminine Mystique. Yes, exactly. And I think it's it's easy to see in, in looking at the book because it is it's an overwhelming amount of work that Betty Crocker demands sometimes. And and, you know, she, and she is very explicit about that. She had this radio show that ran from, I want to say, 1922 up until the dawn of or even beyond the dawn of television into the early 50s. And it, there's a broadcast of her in 1946 saying to this woman writes in saying, you know, I got this job at a grocery store during World War during the war, but I want to keep it and my husband doesn't want me to. And Betty Crocker very explicitly says, you know, part of the reward for winning this war is a healthy home life. And the best thing that you can do, not just for your family, but for your nation, is to quit your job. So I think that speaks to just kind of the way that many of these authors are elevating the work of the home to kind of life and death levels. Yeah, absolutely. So writing a book about American books about bestsellers is, it's a challenge. You've made choices. 
let's imagine you were going to give advice to another writer about you know, writing books, for example, about bestsellers that challenged American myths rather mm-hmm. than the ones that created and sustained them. <laughs> what might make the list? <laughs> I love this question. I think there's a, there's a lot. I do find that sometimes those books tend to succeed more in fiction than in nonfiction, just because I think it's, it feels more uh, safe as a thought experiment. Um, but I would say, you know, Notes of a Native Son by James Baldwin is something that comes to mind. I think really any of the sort of a dystopian fiction by Philip K. Dick is a good, is a good example. I even think to a certain extent, some of the books by John Steinbeck would work, because I think if you think about the uh, the sort of idealization of, of the small farmer that takes place in a book like The Old Farmer's Almanac versus, you know, a book like Grapes of Wrath, you really see kind of the, the gap between mythology and reality. And I think, especially in the 20th century, more and more writers are interested, more interested in exploring that gap than they are in perpetuating the mythology. Yeah, we have a question along similar lines here from from Melanie Hernandez, who says, of the texts you study, are there any that do not reflect assimilationist imperatives? Is their popularity based entirely on their ability to reflect desires of inclusion and upward mobilities? That's a great question. I think, you know, from the ones that I looked at, and I was focused quite heavily on, you know, the, the data of books that sold often in the tens of millions range, of range, I would say, unfortunately, no, they were quite assimilationist. And, and I will say, you know, that changes slightly over time, just in terms of who can even attempt it. Like, for instance, when we talked about Catherine Beecher, it, it was really just middle class, white Protestant women who could even you know, dream of that. And that this changes in the 20th century. But the idea is that you still need to follow a certain set of, say, you know, etiquette rules or whatever they may be. And I I would like to think that that's changing um, slightly over time, but um, unfortunately, not always in our best sellers. That's that's probably true. And I think, you know, again, it goes back to the question we discussed at at the beginning, which is, what counts as a bestseller? Um, right. Anne Lindbergh uh, writes similarly, oh, what about bestsellers that may have been more controversial, such as Uncle Tom's Cabin? Um, Banned Book Week is in public libraries this week, so not all books that have been popular have been universally agreed on. Also, what about the Bible, which almost all American homes own, regardless of socioeconomic standards or race? Great point, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I think you know both of those books are books that I've obviously looked at, but for me, neither of them would have fit into this category as neither would any of the banned books because they tend to be fiction books. And I was looking strictly at nonfiction books. Uh, The Bible, of course, is a touchstone of American society, but as I kind of clarify in the introduction of my book, I'm looking at secular, secular Bibles, books written by Americans for Americans and often for their time. Um, One thing that I will say that I found interesting was that there was some evidence um, by scholars in the, in looking at the 18th century, that not everybody did own a Bible, actually. In, in rural New England, for instance, um, the majority of people did not, um, and, but they were actually more likely uh, by the end of the 18th century to own an almanac than a Bible, simply because it was prohibitively expensive sometimes. That's a great point. Um, and when we think about these books, thinking about the expense that it, that it would have taken to buy them is also important to, to wonder about. You know, do you right. have a- Yeah. Do you have a sense that these books you're writing about were relatively inexpensively purchased? I mean, some of them were probably, um, you know, quite widely available, but were all? No, not all of them. I would say a lot of the earliest ones were. So Webster's Speller, uh, The Old Farmer's Almanac, Benjamin Franklin's Autobiography, they were, you know, really, you could buy them for a pittance. Um, Some of the other books that were more expensive would have been Webster's Dictionary, Emily Post Etiquette. And that was really, you know, kind of a symbol of having made it in some way, if you could purchase a Webster's Dictionary, because it was this huge, expensive book. What I found interesting, though, was that there's evidence that people who did not buy those books were still reading them. So for instance, Emily Post Etiquette, which comes out in 1922, was for many years, I think throughout the 20th century, the second most stolen book in libraries just after the Bible. So come in full circle here. Somehow, I don't think Emily Post would approve. Um, no. 
Start with the Bible. <laughs> Start with the Bible. I mean, and, and, and Ann Lindberg uh, followed up and just said she thinks Bibles were passed down in cookbooks also. Absolutely. So when we think about mm-hmm. best selling, it could be that the people, as you mentioned, some of those books are not because they're selling, they're because they're passed down, because they're stolen, and that's how some of them last over generations. We have a great question here from, from Yu Xing Wu. Um, does the Book of the Month Club make its way into your argument? Fiction, nonfiction, bestsellers, aspirational books. You know, and when, when I think about 1920s, 1930s America with the beginnings of the Book of the Month Club in the 20s, that creates a new mechanism for people to get their books. Definitely, and that was a big part of my research because I do think that you know, the questions of literacy and of especially accessibility to books is a huge question. And it's something that changes so greatly over the courses of American history, where you go from books being quite a rare commodity to the fact that, especially with, you know, Book of the Month Club and the prevalence of mail order books by the early 20th century, it means that even if you live a hundred miles away from even a library or bookstore, you can still have access to books at a low cost. And I think that changes the game in terms of people's access, not just to books, but to education and to self-improvement because so much of what I've noticed in my research about the relationship between books and you know the self in American life is that they're sometimes treated more as a tool than as a treat, say, like the way that we might read a book for pleasure now. Many people seem to be reading the book more for self-betterment. And so that's something that you see expand in the 20th century, especially as people are surmounting crises crises like the Great Depression and and World War II. Yeah. Um, Christy Higginbottom writes, have you taken library use of books into account in addition to the purchase of books as you compiled your list? This could incorporate a larger number of people for whom book purchase is a factor. Great point. Yeah. Yes, yes. Those lists were also something I looked at. The, the thing that's tough about that is that not every library makes available their data for which books are being borrowed the most. It tends to be, you know, urban centers like L.A., Boston, New York, and, I mean, among many other big cities that make their data available. So that certainly was a factor um, and something I looked at, um, particularly for the books in the 20th century. So it certainly was a factor in, in making the list. And I want to put in a plug here for some of the kinds of sources at places like the American Antiquarian Society. We have we have the records of some of the social libraries of the of the early 19th century that in which we have the actual manuscript records of people checking books out of libraries so you can see something about what books are popular in those particular communities. Uh, it's a lot of lot of fun to do that kind of research as well. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. And I'll also I'll also add, you know, I think there's been so many great questions about how a book got on my list or how a book becomes a bestseller. And I think there is, we could have an entire talk about just that. Uh, What I'll say and what I say in the introduction of my book is that my list is really meant to be a starting point. I'm not trying to say these are the 13 most influential books. I'm, you know, making an argument about the way that these books kind of created a certain vision of of values such as self-reliance and meritocracy. And so I think, I hope that it does encourage this kind of conversation where people talk about what were the books that you had growing up that filled this role? What were the books that you wish you had? And so, yeah, I hope that it can kind of encourage that conversation. Yeah. Um, We have an interesting question here from Don Dupre. Um, Were any bestsellers written by Walt Whitman or the Transcendentalists? Hmm. That's an excellent question. I'm not sure of the answer only because I was strictly looking at nonfiction books, Um, but I love Walt Whitman, so I hope so. (laughs) Yeah, well, and in some cases, some of the transcendentalists and other writers of the mid-19th century that we think of as being on all of our class syllabi today may not have been as widely read in their own day as they are now, although some some were. Um, Yeah. Um, Richard Kahn asks, who do you think was the first American to earn a living by writing? Noah Webster, speller since 1773, reader, grammar, et cetera, et cetera. Do do you have a sense of, of, you know, from the, from the author's perspective, Mm. who was, who was making money on their books? I love this question because making money on books is certainly something that I thought about. Um, I I think, you know, Nobster is an interesting example in that he does become very successful later on, but during his own life, he really struggles. You know, he works as 
a school teacher. He works briefly as a lawyer, despite not really having a law background. And so he's really cobbled together. He makes money off of the speller, but the dictionary is kind of considered a commercial flop in his lifetime. He goes into debt writing it. So it's hard to say. I mean, Ben Franklin was certainly a successful writer, but I wouldn't say that that was his primary activity. So um, that's that's a tough one. I'm thinking of Margaret Fuller because now I'm thinking about transcendentalists and their friends, but um, oh, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Yeah, it is a good question. Yeah, I think, well, Franklin's autobiography is basically published after his death. Um, and, right. Yeah, um, although, of course, he had been become known as a writer for for his almanacs, the poor, you know, he, he's sure. with poor Richard, which actually reminds me to ask you about your, your research right here at the American Antiquarian Society. Um, you know, you, you did some of it hit here. What, what did you do here? What did you find? Yeah. So there's some really amazing stuff um, because, you know, the, the, the first edition of the old firm's almanac comes out in 1792 for the 1793 calendar year. And those are unsurprisingly quite, quite difficult to find originals of, of the 1793 through 1800. And so I found 1793 and 1794 in the American Antiquarian Society. I remember driving out there on a snowy day in Worcester many winters back, um, as well as if I recall correctly, but it's been over three years years now, there was some correspondence between, uh, correspondence between Robert B. Thomas and his publisher um, about how many copies to sell and where they were going to sell them, which was very uh, useful information for me. That's fascinating. Yeah. And that's, and that's the kind of evidence of, of actual distribution of the books that sometimes can be hard to come by and, and can usually only be found in archives. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, Mary Beth Norton asks, are Catherine Beecher's and various cookbooks the only ones you studied that are aimed at women? And on a different point, what about Reader's Digest condensed books, which were in my household when I grew up? I had some of those too. I remember mm. those. So the, the first part of the question was about other books aimed at women. Yeah. Yes. So let me think about that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, in the 19th century, just the domestic treatises. And then <clears throat> in the 20th century, there was Emily Post Etiquette book. There was the Buddy Crocker cookbook. And then I also end with a chapter, a kind of dual chapter about the rise of self-help. So I looked at uh, a book by Louise Hay uh, and, and that was more about um, the new age and about the ways in which kind of self-help is being sold to women. So I think, you know, unfortunately, the books that were of this genre, which is to say didactic books that were kind of marketed specifically toward women were focused on the home because that was up until, at least in the public imagination, not necessarily in reality, that was the notion of, of women's roles kind of up until, I would say, you know, the second half of the 20th century, even if, as we know, the reality was there were many women of color and working class women who were working long before then. I will also say there were, that women read many of these other books, even if they weren't specifically marketed to them, just as women read many other kind of novels that weren't specifically marketed to them. So in terms of literacy, I would say, you know, Webster's Speller, as well as the McGuffey readers were books that were meant to educate girls too. And McGuffey has a lot of illustrations about girls and it's very clear that that it's 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 not just for boys learning how to read but it's for girls and and that's reflected in even the literacy rates as we look at the mid-19th century and girls start to surpass um, boys in terms of high school matriculation rates yeah yeah and, and we have a, a great um transnational perspective here from, from Adrian Clarindo, who congratulates you on your wonderful work and says, I'm a Brazilian who studies African-American literature at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, we do have a similar case of two conservative ideas spread in our people's thought by manuals, handbooks, and also TV shows. My question is, what are the steps people should take to try to overcome the legacy of these type of books that shape a prejudicial society? Oh, this is a great question. Yeah. I think it's hard, you know, as, as journalists, we often are pointing out a problem rather than pointing out a solution to it. I think the, the, the kind of small level solution that I came to throughout the research and sort of hint at in the epilogue and what you also hinted at is this idea of, of, of demantling a single story. I think the only way to, to decolonize your mind and your thinking in general is, is simply to read more and to read more widely. And so that often means, and I think more often than not, it means not looking at the bestseller list. You know, th that certainly can be an indicator, but you know, if you want to look at, 
you know, a books that come from a broader perspective, ask your indie bookseller, ask, you know, a friend, ask um, one of the many, you know, great academics that are teaching in the local Boston area. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways to kind of seek out and find broader perspectives. And I think much of that can be done through reading, just as, you know, some of the ills can come through reading. I think the cure can, can partially at least come through reading as well. Uh, excellent, excellent. Patricia Schaffenberg, um, Contribute to a question we were asking before about people who, who earn their money on lit, uh, from writing. And she writes, Franklin combined writing, editing, publishing, and advertising to achieve financial success. So he gets my vote for making a living from writing since he turned most of that over to a partner when he was 42 and was well off the rest of his life. But did he make any money off his subsequent scientific writings? Hmm. Yeah, the scientific writings, I'm not sure about. I will quibble with that slightly in saying that uh, at least in my research, the vast majority of his wealth comes from printmaking, not from writing specifically. And yes, part of that is the newspaper and the almanacs that he runs and partially writes, but much more of it comes from, from advertising, say. That's a really good point, that, that mm -hmm. it really is his, his printing business. And then he sets up printers all over the colonies um, right. over, the, over those early years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's also what makes him quite a quite a unique case is that, you know, he does retire in his early 40s and and he's remembered for so many of the things that he did post retirement, such as diplomacy, the scientific experiments come afterward and, you know, the autobiography, which is published posthumously, but is written in that post kind of post retirement, so to speak, phase, even though he is working in some sense for another. Exactly. Um, Debbie Schaefer Jacobs, this, this is great because we're getting questions that ask about particular works that didn't that aren't in your book, but but maybe are interesting to think mm -hmm. about. New England primers. Um, Franklin supposedly published one, but only Yale has a copy. Well, the New England primers are, are in lots and lots of places. Obviously, yes. it's one of the one of the early American books. Yes, I actually almost did include the New England Primer because um, it is, you know, in many ways bestseller. I did just because it was published pre the United States being a nation and it was written by, you know, a British author. And so, er, yeah, I'm almost certain about that. It's been a while, but uh, so for me, I wanted to focus more on, on books that were written kind of with more of a sense of nationhood in mind. But I do, I think a lot of the roots of it can be seen in the way that Webster conceives of or doesn't conceive of uh, teaching spellings, teaching literacy, and also McGuffey, you know, McGuffey is very clearly coming out of a, a Calvinist background and a Presbyterian background. And that's something that is hugely prevalent in kind of the, the morality of, of the New England primer, which is uh, pretty, you know, uh, thunder and, and brimstone. Yeah, and Richard Kahn, on, on a similar topic, finds it interesting that Webster is a favorite of religious community, yet did not feel the speller should be using biblical quotations. Yes, you know, this is such a fascinating, a bit of a, a tangent um, it, that I was so shocked. I've, you know, I've, I've interviewed what, so the current editors of the dictionary many times and um, Pierre Soglossi, one of the editors said to me, at our book first, we always have conservative Christian homeschoolers coming up to us asking if we're going to reprint um, the 1828, the original Webster Dictionary, because it's out of print, and they consider it to be, you know, the only Christian Bible, uh, or sorry, the only Christian dictionary, which is quite interesting because he does use a lot of biblical references as, as well as a lot of biblical language in the ways that he defines everything from, you know, love to, you know, writing. Yeah. Melanie Hernandez asks a great question, which would be a great question for anyone doing research. What surprised you in your research? Was there anything that seemed to come out of nowhere? So many things, so many things. Um, let's see. This this was a really a tangent, and it, I think it goes to show how much I love research and, and will research, research, and research until someone forces me to write. Um, I came across a, uh, of a tuberculosis-fueled vampire panic in Massachusetts in the early 19th century, which was essentially just tuberculosis that a lot of people had had, but the way that it was killing people quickly and killing young people led them to believe that it was vampires doing this. And the writer Bram Stoker comes to visit 
uh, around this time and is visiting with a friend of his, I want to say it was Emerson. And he says, you know, what's going on in your town? And, and the writer says to him, well, there's this tuberculosis fueled vampire panic. And Bram Stoker returns and writes uh, Dracula, which I find sort of fascinating. Um, but more on topic, I think so many of the, the writers just led lives that were so different from, from how they appeared on the page. Emily Post being one of them. She writes this book about rules and etiquette, but her career is born out of scandal when her husband cheats on her and is caught up in a blackmail scheme that ends up in court and she's sort of forced to work for her own money despite having grown up in quite this white gloved uh you know milieu so that uh, that is always fascinating to me that's great yeah um ursula anwar asks were there prohibited books in the united states as for example the catholic book had some a catholic church had some on its list I don't know that the, the United States itself prohibited books, although certainly um, our laws of obscenity prevented some books from getting brought into the United States at, at various points. Um, sure. And somebody else brought up banned books, um, which I think is an, an certainly an interesting topic in terms of what people consider accepted thought or, you know, accepted ideas for the vast public. However, because Again, I was looking at books that were bestsellers. It's not, it wasn't something that um, really factored into this particular thesis. Yeah, and Melanie comes back, comes back and says, I wanna know what the source is for the tuberculosis vampire, va vampire panic. I need to read this right now. <laughs> yes, yes, I gotta find a link for that. There's a great article in the Smithsonian about it. I think if you Google tuberculosis fuel vampire panic Smithsonian, there can't be more than one result on that. <laughs> Where was that? Was that was that a particular town-based thing? I mean, it's it's sort of off topic, but it's yeah. it's neat. no, it's fascinating. I mean, again, this research was we're now talking two and a half years ago. Um, I know there was one in Massachusetts. I think there was also a second one in Connecticut because it was you know, fear is certainly contagious. Yeah. So this is this question from Ann Lindbergh really gets at the heart of studying popular or or widely selling books. It's probably difficult to answer, but were the books popular because they agreed with a aligned with a particular view, or did the books create the view, or both? Yeah, this is a great question. I think it it gets to the heart of what my argument is, which is that it's it's essentially both. And I think you know to, just to take one example, Noah Webster is a great example of this. So he writes the, the speller and also the dictionary. And, and his idea is we are going to make American English as different from British, Ang British English as, you know, Swedish or Dutch are from German. And so there is certainly a political thrust behind what is otherwise a quite a radical idea. So in some ways, this is a new idea that he's having, although other people at the time are certainly talking about what are ways that we can make our mark be independent through language and in other ways at the same same time, part of the reason why it resonates on such a huge scale is that notions of uh, a new empire, notions of this kind of free and Christian republic built on the backs of small farmers and, you know, enterprising young self-made people is something that was already an idea that was uh, available. And it was also an idea that resonated with people. So often the way that it works is these, these writers are taking something that exists in, in the public's kind of consciousness and they're blowing it up to a larger proportion all while kind of incorporating their own fingerprint, their own agenda, their own beliefs and hopes and often fears about what America could be and what it perhaps in their minds should become. And Webster didn't, it's worth noting, didn't exactly succeed in making American English all that different from British English, did he? I mean, he yes did. and no. I mean, he did get rid of the CK in words like music. He did get rid of the U in words like honor. He changed defense. I mean, so all of many, if not all of the spellings that we attribute to American English are, are from him. I would also say some of, you know, his, his more, um, uh, original definitions linger. There was one scholar who claimed that he was one of the first to put the word, the definition for the word immigrant as to, you know, locate to a new country permanently and credits this as, as changing Americans understanding of how immigration works. I think I can quibble with how, how true that is or is not, but I think, you know, yes and no, he didn't get everything he wanted. He wanted words to be spelled tongue like T-U-N-G and women, W-I-M-M-E-N, which we haven't completely gotten to. We haven't, we haven't quite made it there, have we? No. <laughs> no. What are you working on now? 
What's next? It's a, great, it's a great question. I'm actually kind of in the midst of, of, of figuring out what's next. I'm always sort of been looking through the archives for something new. Um, so we shall see. Great. Um, and, and so if we have time for a few more questions. If, if folks want to ask any other questions, we do have um, somebody, uh, Sharon, Sharon Bernard has posted the Smithsonian story in the, in the Q&A about the great New England vampire panic. So that is that there, go, go find it. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as I think about a topic we haven't talked about so far, what, what do you make of, of how amazon.com shapes our sense of best-selling books. If you go to Amazon, you'll find now it's bestsellers in practically every different category, every different topic. Does Amazon change the way we think about what a bestseller even is anymore? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in that way. And I'm loath to, you know, as someone who loves books and booksellers to give Amazon kudos, but that is true. I mean, I think you can really narrow in on a very specific topic, whether it's, you know, women's uh, studies and very specific aspects of women's studies, or even, you know, different types of, I've, I've looked at different type of types of reference bestsellers, which is not something you could very easily do before Amazon, which I think is, is an interesting tool. On the other hand, I'm, I'm always sort of loath because it's just destroyed so much of the, the ecosystem of, of booksellers, which I also think is such an invaluable resource in terms of giving people suggestions about, about books to read that are not necessarily on the bestseller list. Absolutely. And I noticed earlier when you said, you know, when people, somebody asked, how do you, how do you find out what to read that might um, go up against some of these, these um, more uh, mainstream works, go to your indie bookseller. And I yes. think that's a great, great piece of advice. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we have to, we have to make sure that these booksellers have, you know, re remain with us and they often are going to provide advice that's distinctive and, and book suggestions that are distinctive from what somebody gets from an algorithm. It's a very different Certainly. way. And there's, I think we're lucky in New England to have so many. I love, you know, Riff Raff and Providence is a great place, Trident in Boston. And I'm always amazed by kind of just the level of knowledge of a bookseller. I, I remember going up to a bookseller and saying, you know, I'm looking for a novel that involves, you know, witchcraft and Greek mythology. And sure enough, she was able to find something for me in about two minutes. So it's, it's sort of incredible. Exactly. And Tidepool here in Worcester. And the other thing that, that the mm -hmm. independent booksellers do is, is they create communities around books uh, with, with book programs and so on. We try to do that with some of these programs for the American Antiquarian Society, but booksellers have been doing that for, for generations now, bringing people together around books. And it's, it's really an important part of our, our ecosystem. So it's great to, to bring that up. And, and one of our, our um, viewers also mentions, ask your librarian also important yes. things about the role of libraries in circulating books. Just, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you tonight about America's bestsellers this evening. Um, thanks so much, Jess, for, the, for, your, for your time this evening. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much for all of your, your wonderful questions. It's been a great discussion. And yes, talk to your librarians, talk to your booksellers. It's a perfect note to end on. Absolutely. And I want to thank all of you who've been watching this evening. If you'd like to recommend this program to friends, our public programs are available on the American Antiquarian Society YouTube channel. So this, is, this will be available soon. We also encourage you to check out our upcoming programs, which are listed on the AAS website. Next Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, I'll be talking with Craig Fairman, who's the author of a book called Author in Chief, The Untold Story of Our Presidents and the Books They Wrote. It's a kind of combination of presidential history and book history. He's done a lot of research in the archives on readers, not just on authors. It's, it's great stuff. And then several weeks from now on October 21st, we have our annual Barron Lecture, um, which will be uh, given by James Merrill about his book. And the Barron Lecture is a lecture given about a book that was quite acclaimed and won major prizes uh, several decades ago. And it's, it's, uh, the author comes back and talks with us about the impact that book has had and how they think about it since. Uh, James Merrill of Vassar University will be talking about his book, The Indian's New World, which won uh, the Bancroft Prize. Uh, and so we're looking forward to that on October 21st. But before that, next week, Craig Fairman. Thanks so much, Jess. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight and we'll see you again soon. Have a good evening. Thanks so much.